Well, good morning. Uh, so glad to be here together. Uh, before we get started, I want to open this up with a word of prayer. Uh, dear Lord, uh, Father, thank you so much uh, for allowing us to be here in your house this morning, singing and praising of the goodness of God. Lord, we thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. Lord, let us not lose sight of the fact that you are good in all things, Father. Lord, I thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for allowing us to be able to come here this morning to worship and praise you freely. Lord, I just pray that if anything is taken from this service, Father, it is that you are good and that you love us. Father, I pray that you would just speak and move in this place today. Lord, make us attentive to your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, good morning. So glad to be here uh, to, with you this morning on this great day in the Lord's house. Um, but it, not only that, it's a Mother's Day, and so it's an extra special day. Um, and we get to recognize all the mother figures that we've had in our lives, whether it be grandmothers or foster mothers or relatives or friends that we look up to in a motherly way. And uh, over the past month, um, Try and Trevor and myself, we have been in a sermon series called the Save Two series. So things that we're saved to. Once we have a relationship with Jesus, we are called to do stuff. We are saved to things. So this morning, we're going to introduce a new sermon series called the Questions That Jesus Asked. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm around children, it seems like kids never are quiet. It seems like they're constantly asking questions. As Cal raises his hand. And so, and I'm going to use Cal as an example. Sometimes Cal will ask a question before a question. He's like, hey, mom and dad, can I ask you a question? And then he asks the real question. Um, and actually, research backs this up because I looked at it this week and I studied that a four year old, this is really impressive, a four year old averages 300 questions per day. So, if you think about that, a four-year-old ask around 300 questions a day. That's a lot of questions. Um, but at the heart of a question, we're seeking to gain something, right? We're usually seeking to gain knowledge or understanding or the better grasping of something. Um, questions can be used to answer other questions. Um, it can be said that asking questions is an art form, really. Um, and so what can we learn today from questions that Jesus asked? So if you think about that, uh, we know that Jesus is omniscient. We know he's om omnipresent. We know he's omnipotent. He's everywhere. He knows all things. So does Jesus not know the answers to the questions he asked? Well, of course Jesus knew, but we're going to see how Jesus uh, is the perfect master of asking questions. And so Jesus is actually recorded uh, in the four Gospels of asking over 300 questions. So Jesus asked a lot of questions. And this morning we're going to be studying and seeking out the meaning to one particular question that he asked his own mother. Um, but today, um, as we jump in, um, you may be thinking, well, that doesn't really sound like a Mother's Day message. Well, we're not going to be doing a traditional Mother's Day Day's message today. We're, we're not talking about Hannah or Proverbs 31. Um, and, but we're, we also realize that mothers and motherly figures have so many roles, we can't even begin to name them all, and we're grateful for all that. Um, but today, I hope you're as excited as I am to dive into our topic. And so let's start with Mother uh, Mary, Jesus' own mother. And I hope today that we can look at this question and with the hope that Mary did, the hope of being redeemed by Jesus. So this morning, we're going to be primarily in John chapter 2 and Luke chapter 1. So if you want to look in your Bible, that's where I would go ahead and turn to. Um, I'm going to have the text on the screen for you, so if you don't want to open up your Bible, I'll have them up here for you. Um, but with that, we'll get started and we'll jump in. So on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So before we go any farther, we have to talk about weddings in Jesus' time. So who knows anything about a traditional Jewish wedding back in Jesus' day? Does anybody know? Okay. So weddings back then were nothing like weddings today. Weddings lasted almost an entire week. So the ceremony lasted for an entire week. So... 
Mo- I'm sure most of you in here are married um, or have been married before. So I couldn't imagine my wedding ceremony lasting for a full week. Okay, so but it goes even deeper than that. It goes so much deeper than that. If you are the host of a wedding, you are responsible for feeding and providing refreshments for every person that came to the ceremony. So think about that. Think about the burden that that would create. There were no such thing as, there was no snail mail. There was no Facebook. There was no RSVP online sign up. You couldn't just say, hey, I'm coming to your wedding. You may, you may travel for three or four days and just show up. So you didn't know who was going to show up to the ceremony at all the time. So think about the chaos that that could create. Think about even today in our weddings, if we had even 50 people show up that you didn't know were coming, that would be chaotic. So before we step into the chaos of this wedding, before we go any further, I want us to go back. We're going to look at Luke chapter 1 when we were first introduced to Mary. This is going to be Luke 1, 26. Uh, we're going to start there. So, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So there is no doubt that in this story we see that Mary knew that her unborn son was going to be the Messiah, that he's going to be our Messiah. I'm sure Mary was scared. She was terrified and afraid, but she knew that God had chosen her to be the mother of his only son. I'm sure never in a thousand lifetimes could Mary have ever dreamt that she would be the mother of Jesus. Yet she was obedient. We see that she was obedient. And she said, God's will be done. So can you imagine as a parent, the fear and anxiety of, of, as a expectant parent, you have lots of emotions, but Mary would have had those too. But we know Mary was faithful and obedient to God with Jesus' upbringing. Mary would have had grown to love Jesus as her own precious little son. She knew he was the promised Messiah, and we know that he ultimately paid the ultimate price for our sin. You think about that. God's only son, Mary holding him every time she looked at him or changed his diapers or cloth, whatever they had that day, or fed him, she was holding God's own son. So if, you, if you're a parent, you know the relationship with, you have with your child and how there's nothing more precious than a newborn baby. There's nothing like it. But Mary knew from the start that one day something was going to be different for Jesus. And that also had to be very terrifying. So Mary might not have known the exact plan that God had in store for Jesus, but we do. Because we know Romans 6.23 tells us that the free gift of eternal life that he did for, he gave us us. That's so amazing. It's free. The ultimate price he paid with his own life because he loves us. And Romans 5.8 tells us that at our very worst, while we were still God's enemy, Christ died for us. And that's amazing. So the, it's, it's the best news ever. Jesus willingly died for us. Now let's go back to Mary. She knew that she was one day going to have to give up her son because he was our Messiah. That had to be very hard and 
probably had, she had lots of questions, I'm sure. But we're going to see that Mary had an eternal hope that was even greater than her maternal hopes. So let's go back to John chapter 2. We're going to pick up there. John 2, 3 says, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. So a few moments ago we read in Luke 1 that Mary was told that she was to be the mother of our Messiah. So Mary knew that Jesus was sent to do miraculous and wonderful things for the entire world. She also would have known by this point that Jesus had been publicly announced as our Messiah by John the Baptist. So she had all these signs telling her, hey, Jesus is our Messiah. Well, in Jewish customs, uh, as we talked about a little bit in the wedding, if you run out of food or drink for all these people that came to the ceremony throughout the, cu- the week, um, it would be an ultimate disgrace. It would be a very, very shameful thing for the family to run out of food or drink. So Mary finds herself in this place of, hey, Jesus, we have this problem. And so we see Mary trusted Jesus to do something. She knew and she trusted Jesus that she could take her worries and problems to him. So Mary seems to step in in this place of this chaos and say to Jesus, hey, they have nothing left. And I think Mary informed Jesus with the hope that he would do something. And Mary knew Jesus best out of all all those present. But she knew Jesus was different. She had an eternal hope in Jesus, and she trusted him that he could solve her problems. So you think about that. Jesus can solve our problems. We have an eternal hope. This, this exact moment would have been so chaotic for Mary and all of those there, the host of the ceremony. We aren't told who the bride and the groom are in this ceremony, but what does matter is we can see how chaotic that this time would have been for everyone involved. So while you and I may not be at this ceremony, at this wedding ceremony, we not, may not be a host of this wedding banquet, we are in a way, because we are in the chaos called life. Everywhere that we look, we have problems. Everywhere that we turn, there's chaos all amongst us. We have unexpected medical bills, unexpected medical diagnoses. Maybe you've struggled with a job loss or relationship problems or abuse or neglect or you name it. There's chaos all around us. The world is full of problems. So do you know who you can turn to when life gives you chaos? So let's go back and see what happens next. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Now your translation may say, woman, or what business do you have with me, woman? Or what concerns do you have with me, woman? Um, I think it's very important that we we address this question first. Um, So in the Greek to English translations, we actually do not have a perfect word for how to how to translate this. So I don't want us to lose this. There is nothing derogatory about how Jesus addressed his mother with this question. Um, It was actually shown and meant as a form of the ultimate respect. And so even your Bibles may have little footnotes down there that said this, uh, this is not meant as a form of disrespect. But I believe today this is an exact question that Jesus asked each and every person. What why do you involve me? Why do you involve me? Put your name there. Trey, why do you involve me? Amber, why do you involve me? Why do you involve me? See, Mary knew that Jesus was the answer to our biggest question of them all. He is the answer to who can save us and who can save us from all of our chaos. Not only is Jesus the answer to every problem, he's the answer to our eternal problem. See, Mary, the mother of Jesus, knew that he was and is the only hope we have in this life. Mary trusted God, our Father, in Christ's supernatural birth, but we also see that she trusted Jesus with her eternal birth. Jesus is the only way that we can be born again. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to them, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The greatest question you could ever answer on earth, one that Mary clearly answered with a resounding yes, one that I pray each and every person here today will know or does know the answer to. 
Is Jesus your personal Lord and Savior? Have you placed your faith in Him? Have you surrendered everything to Him? If you have, that's the best news ever. We should always take every problem, everything to Jesus. He is always with us, but we're also supposed to be on mission for Him every single day. If you don't know the answer to that question, or if you've never answered that question before, I pray today that you will by the time you leave here. And I, we're going to continue on in John 2 and see how this story unfolds. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jar, jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So like Mary, we must fully trust Jesus with our problems. She didn't know what Jesus was going to do in the exact situation, but she trusted that he had the plan. Jesus has the plan. Jesus has the solution for all of our problems. While we are not guaranteed deliverance from our problems here on earth, we do have the promise and the assurance that we will be delivered in heaven with him one day if he is your Lord and Savior. There is one more very, very important thing I want to talk about today in this story and something I'm very excited to share about, and that's the stone water jars. If you love me, you keep my commands. Sorry, I skipped that part. Mary was obedient because she told the servants to do what Jesus commanded her. Now the stone water jars, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So these jars, okay, in this day would have been reserved for the ceremonial cleansing. So before any religious ceremonies or before any eating took place, there would have been these big jars. And so before you could come into the place, you would take this water and you would rinse your hands. You would wash them off. So within these jars, you can imagine the filth. Think about how dirty and nasty that water would have been. They didn't have the same cleanliness practices that we have today, but the water would have been filthy. Okay. So that's what that's what these people would do. They'd come and wash themselves in these basins, in these stone jars. So think about this nasty, how nasty this would have been. So, y'all, this, this is so exciting. And so I want you to think about what is the nastiest liquid that you have ever seen? The nastiest liquid you've ever seen. Could be like used cooking oil. Could be motor oil. Could be like a churn, like a big jar of like muddy river water, just nasty, pure filth. Just think about how nasty that liquid was, okay? No amount of cleaning really would ever make me want to drink that water. It's just kind of gross. Think about the health hazards you could, you could face from drinking that water. So everybody has a good idea of what that looks like. So I want to, don't miss this today. We are that dirty water. We are, every one of us, before we come to Christ, we are that dirty water. We are the nastiest, filthiest thing ever. Before Jesus, we are muck. I, my favorite, one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament is Isaiah 64, 6. And it says, all of us have become one, like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sin sweeps us away. So before Christ, there's nothing that we can do to make us righteous. Nothing on our own. We can't give enough money. We can't do enough good deeds. We can't pray enough. We can't do anything on our own. Nothing 
will make us clean, but only through Jesus. So I have an interesting analogy here. So if you see the water here on the, on the screen, it's pretty nasty. It doesn't show up, the color doesn't show up the greatest. But I thought this would be a really good analogy to make is that that is us before Jesus. Now, did anybody sign up to drink that today? Because I know I wouldn't. Um, but when we surrender to Jesus, this is what Jesus does for us. See that nasty filth. But in steps Jesus. He takes the same water. He makes it clean. He removes all of our impurities. Jesus bared it all for us on the cross. You may be thinking you're, you've done something so bad that you could never surrender your life to Christ. Well, I'm, t I'm here to tell you today, God does not care. He does not care what you've done. He loves you. He went to the cross at your very worst. He makes you clean. Jesus went to the cross for every single person, freely died, went to the grave, rose again, and defeated hell in the grave forever. He does that for every single person. Y'all, we're all that dirty water at some point in our life, before we have Christ, we're all that dirty water. But after we have Jesus, he makes us pure and he makes us clean. I think something else is so cool is that later in the Bible, we're told that Jesus' blood is representative of the wine. And that's the wine the wine represents Jesus' blood, and that's so cool. And this is at, this was at the Lord's Supper. It says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. So, y'all, there's so much to the story, and I think we miss it. It's so simple that we miss it. But when we surrender our life to Christ, Jesus is the one that makes us clean. We can't do it on our own. Jesus did it for us. He will make us white as snow. And I think that is amazing. We're freely given this. 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then Romans 3.22 says, This is righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. And I love that. We are made righteous only by Christ. He is the one that cleans us up. We don't have to clean ourselves up first to go to him. Jesus does the work for us. And that is amazing. So on the outside, going back to this problem at the, at the wedding ceremony, the problem that Mary faced didn't look like a spiritual problem at all. It looked like a physical problem. Nobody was in physical distress. There really wasn't really any problem except for maybe somebody was embarrassed probably. But Jesus cared enough. He cared. He took the not-so-important problems that we have, and he turns it into the message of hope of what he can do for us. He makes us clean by his blood. We can take these same ordinary problems that we face every single day and flip them, flip the script and point to Christ. Say, hey, Jesus is the answer to all our problems. That's that's what we're supposed to do as believers. We can flip that problem and shine the light of Christ. And I think that is so awesome. The true miracle in the story is that Jesus longs to do for each and every one of us the best miracle ever, and that is to make us righteous. And I think that is amazing. There is a party in heaven every time a, a new believer comes to faith. And I think that is amazing. We're all called. Jesus freely died for us. That is a miracle that he willingly went to the cross for every single person. So this morning, as we move into a time of invitation, um, 
I just, I just pray that you obediently listen to the Holy Spirit. And I, I pray that if you've never been washed by Jesus' blood, that you will surrender your life to him. Let him take away your shame, your guilt, your filth. He will make you pure. He will make you righteous. It does not matter. You don't have to clean yourself up first because Jesus did the work for you. Maybe you're here today and you've forgotten the miracle that Jesus has done in your own life. Maybe, maybe he has made you clean, but you've fallen away in your walk with him and you need to rededicate your life to him or you need to cry out to him. He's there. He's waiting. You don't have to do anything. He's, he's already there. So this morning, I pray that you listen to how the Holy Spirit is calling you, and I pray that you're obedient. And this morning, lastly, if you have been looking for a new family of believers to join, we would love to have you here. God is doing great things here in this church. And I pray that you will humbly seek the Lord's will for you and seek his guidance for what he is calling you to do. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for today. Lord, I can't even put into words how awesome it is that at my worst, and at our worst, you went to the cross for us. Lord, I pray that if somebody's never experienced that, that just the freedom and the, you washing them, making them clean, taking away their sin. Lord, I pray that they would, they would surrender their life to you. Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage each and every day, not only here at church, Lord, but in our workplace and in our homes and in our community to shine your light and tell others of all that you have done for us. Lord, forgive us, Lord, when we don't share the hope of the gospel. Lord, I pray today that your will be done in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.